Now, the third rule that we have to consider when we're talking about Diels Alder is a rule called the endo rule. So let's first describe what endo means. So it turns out that when we do a cyclo addition like the following Diels Alder that we see down here, we get this bicyclic structure that has substituents either pointing down. So these down positions here are called the endo positions. This is also endo. And then this top position here, it's really on top just like this, is your exo position. So this is exo and exo. Now it turns out that when you build this molecule and look at it, that these exo positions are typically the places where you would put substituents um, to be in more stable positions. So endo is a lower position, exo, and the higher position. Now, when you carry out a reaction like this Diels Alder, you'd expect that that exo position, since it's um, less sterically hindered, that would be the position where you find the substituents most of the time. But it turns out that that's not the case. So what happens is, predominantly, we end up seeing the endo product being formed. Now, part of that has to do with this thing called secondary pi orbital overlap. So often on the diene, we have electron donating uh, groups. <coughs> often on the diene, we have these electron withdrawing groups, like a carbonyl. So if we look at the structure, here on this top is you have your HOMO, highest occupied molecular orbital of the diene, and your LUMO down here below. And we saw this a couple of pages ago. Now what happens is that these lobes match up on top of each other, right? So what forms right there is our overlap to give us our sigma bonds being formed. Now, when we point, and this is important here, when we point this atom and this atom, now that's a pi bond, so that's something like a carbonyl, for example, right? So you might have something that looks like that there. Um, that the orbitals of, of that actually end up overlapping here too. So we see the secondary p orbital overlap. And then that overlap here, so I'll just make a note down here below, that this overlap causes a decrease in our activation energy. So it means the transition state's more stable. So if you're looking at reaction energy profile, you'd start off here, right? You come up here, come down. That's reaction pathway number one. Or we could come up here and come down to, you know, around right there. So this pathway here has a lower activation energy than that. Right, so here's your activation energy. And we could say that's your EA here for the exo position. And this is your EA for the endo. Because it has a lower activation energy, it actually gives us the kinetic product. But this exo position is more stable, so it gives rise to the thermo dynamic product. So what we're going to see is the kinetic. So we follow the endo rule. Okay. I'd like to look at an example with you here of the Diels-Alder reaction. So let's take this molecule cyclopentadiene and this dienophile with an aldehyde substituent on it. This is how you'd see the problem written in the text. So to figure out the solution to this problem, let's come over here and look at this template that I have for you. 
So this is going to be one of our approaches. Remember um, that the p orbitals here, right? Those have to overlap with the p orbitals here for the pi bond. So this is what we would call a bottom attack. So what's going to happen is that this carbon here is going to come over and make a bond with that carbon, okay? And that this carbon is going to come back here all the way back here and make a bond with this carbon. Now, when that happens, there's going to have to be some movement of some of the substituents here. So we call this little point inner. So they're pointing in. So when we carry out this reaction, this group right here, which is just a CH2 group, is actually going to go up. It's going to point up. All right. Now, this group here, if you remember our template from a couple lectures ago, and this H right here, so the aldehyde and the H are going to get pushed down. Now, remember that we want to have this CHO group pointing back towards the pocket back here. Right, so we want it to come back so that we get that overlap with the pi orbitals or the p orbitals um, at that back carbon. Now, as we come in and that gets pushed up, we're going to get a template. So let's look at that next template. So we're going to get this is our kind of skeletal st structure here. So this carbon here and this carbon here are these two guys. Right? And in between them, connected between them, is this CH2 group here. So that CH2 group is coming up and then back and down just like that. Okay. Now on the carbon from our dienyl file here, right, those are the blue guys over here, we have atoms that are pointing down. Right, remember that's the endo position, so that's going to put our aldehyde here, and the other atom is just an H. So then pointing up here are just H's like this. Right, so that's going to be um, our product. Now it's fairly common to write it out um, this way, but also we'll see it written out a lot of times in our solution manual is a flat molecule. So to flatten this out, we're going to take it and draw it like this. We're going to essentially going to take the molecule and we're going to kind of um, rotate it towards ourselves. Now when we do that, we're going to end up having that CH2 group pointing out towards us. And I'm just going to write it like this just because I think it makes it a little clearer. So you got your CH2 like that. And then this group here is going to be this carbon. Right? Those are the carbons, the new carbons that we have there, right, from our dienophile. That CHO group is going to be back on a dash. And then also we can't forget to put in our carbon carbon double bond. All right, so that would be our bottom approach. Now normally we could just draw the enantiomer of this because this is a chiral molecule. You'll, you'll form enantiomeric pairs. I do want to show you though how this is formed. So I want to look down here below and show you what this would look like if we do a top attack. So you don't have to do this for every problem but I just want to show it to you here for those of you who are curious. So still the same alignment with that CHO group pointing back towards this back pocket part of our dyne. And then that carbon's coming down and making a bond right there. And this carbon's coming down and making a bond right here. So when we approach from the top, this little inner CH2, that group is going to get pushed down. All right? Well, that means that these other groups before that were pushed down 
are going to get pushed up. So we're going to push them up just like this. Okay. So then in our structure over here, our little template structure, let's look over here. Um, that is going to take our CH2. So our CH2 is going to come back like this and then connect right here. And those carbons here are the carbons that are highlighted in our structure on the left. Okay. Now this carbon right here is going to have a CHO group on it. So we're going to put a CHO here. We're going to put an H there. And then pointing down would be your H and your H there. Now we can flatten this image out and it's often easier to flatten it out to see how the two products are related to each other. But that will give us our ring with our double bond. If we do that same type of rotation, our CH2 here is going to be pointing away from us. Right. And then this little shoulder is going to be where my CHO group is. Okay. And as we pull that towards ourselves and rotate it towards ourselves, the CHO group will become a wedge. Right? And that would be our other attack. Now we don't have to show this for every reaction, but we do need to include it as a product. So if you look back at the two products that we have here, right, we have formed this product from this bottom attack and the product from the top attack. Now the relationship between these right now these are an anti-merge to each other. So often what we'll do is we'll just draw this product out here and then we'll just change the wedges and the dashes to get the enantiomer where those carbons react. So let's take a look at another example. Let's come down here below and look at um, this 1,3-butadiene um, reacting with this disubstituted dienophile. So we'll put two aldehyde groups on there. So as we arrange this out down below, this is what we might do. So here's a here's a bottom attack here. So as we do our bottom attack, remember carbon coming up here, reacting with this carbon. This carbon's coming back and reacting right there. What I like to do on these problems is I like to put in a carbon here, a carbon, and just remind myself that these H's are pointing in and kind of going out like that. The only reason I like to do that, I find students find it helpful, is to remember that these H atoms here are going to get pushed up as we approach from the bottom, and that these two aldehyde groups will get pushed down. They'll be in the down position, the endo position. All right, so when we look at our bottom attack this direction, we would continue on here. And we want to try to draw this. So we're going to come up and over, and then come down like so. And then remember to put in your double bond there. Now, these are just H's. So they're not critical to leave here because we don't usually include them, right? Um, they're understood to be there. Now the CHO groups though are going to be pointing down. So they're going to look like this. And then often students find it helpful to put the H in there also. Um, that's helpful because when you rotate this thing to make it a flat molecule, it just helps you remember where those groups are going to go. So a lot of times the answer key won't have this kind of boat looking confirmation. What it will have instead is it will have these CHO groups as substituents off of a flat cyclohexene structure. So as we rotate that towards us, those CHO groups are going to be pointing back as a dash.
So then what we can do here is we can realize, well, this is not the um, only possibility of what might form. So the other possible product would be this, and let's look at it. So the other product that could potentially form would be having those aldehyde groups on wedges. Now that forms for sure, but do you see the problem here? So the problem is that this molecule has a mirror plane of symmetry here. So because of that, it is meso, which means that these two products are the same. So we're not going to include that as a product because it's not unique, it's identical. So that's not always going to be the case, but it just is in this particular example. Let's take our aldehydes and we'll make them trans here. Now, if you remember before, we can use the shortcut, which says if they're trans in the beginning, then the substituents will be trans in the end. But just to kind of show you how that would form, let's take a look at it down below. So hopefully you're getting hang feeling how this kind of works. So here's our carbons. This is the new bond that's going to be made. Here we have no substituent other than H, so we're not too concerned with stereochemistry. But remember, these guys here, if we're pointing, we're going to be pointing up. So we're going to go up, and then these two guys will be pushed down as we approach from this angle. So they'll be endo. Now we can't put the CHO group, both of them, and get them in the endo position. So it's unavoidable here. So we just do our best and we get a mixture of products. So let's take a look and see what we're going to get here. So as we draw that out, right, we would have our structure looking like this. Now I'm not going to draw out the H's that are here because as we saw up above it wasn't really that necessary. But off of this carbon here you're going to have an H that's pointing down right? and the other carbon is going to have a CHO group pointing down. So then an H goes here and then a CHO group goes there. So those are kind of crammed in there together but Right, that's going to be a different group, and right, so the two different groups, one on top of each other, essentially. Um, but the way this is going to look when we flatten the molecule out, it's like this. So this carbon here, the one that's bulleted, is going to have a CHO group. It's pointing out at you, and this guy in the back is going to have a CHO group that's back on. Uh, dash there. So that's one possibility and then you can go through and do the whole top attack thing or you can just realize that when you do that the position of those CHO groups will just change. Right? So then these are going to be enantiomers to each other. Okay. So the only thing that gets a little bit trickier here, and you may have noticed this, other than these H's that are central right here becoming um, connected as a CH2, as in cyclopentadiene, um, the, the diene's been relatively simple. 